for this night and thank you Lord for giving us your word Lord we, we cherish it at least we should we cling to it at least we should and uh, Lord it's your word it comes from your heart I pray Lord that it will penetrate our hearts I pray to God, that, to God that we would leave here tonight with just a greater desire to spend time in your word so we, we can hear you speak to us and, and that we want to have more time in prayer so we can talk to you and get to know you in a, in a much deeper, in a more intimate way. It's in your name that I pray. Amen. I've entitled tonight's prayer, tonight's message, The Prayer of a Righteous Man. We're going to be looking at, uh, we're continuing in Daniel chapter 9. This, is, this will be our second week. Next week will be um, our last week. Uh, we're going to be looking at a very difficult uh, passage next week. So you, your lesson's long. So start on it. Don't wait till uh, next uh, Monday to, to get started on it. So tonight I want to talk about prayer. What exactly is prayer? Did you know that God created us men because he wanted us to have fellowship with him? He, he created us with this innate need and desire, whether we acknowledge it or not, to spend time with our Creator because He wants us to know Him intimately. This is why, this is why He created us with a spirit. Now, we're born with a, a dead spirit, but when, when we place our trust in Jesus, that dead spirit comes alive. That's what the term regeneration means. You, it, it means. That's what Jesus talked about with Nicodemus. You must be born again. And when your spirit comes alive, then and only then do you have the means by which you can communicate with God. And so prayer should be a two-way conversation with God. When you pick up your Bible to read it, this is how God will speak to you primarily. Now, he can speak to you on the radio through a preacher who's preaching God's Word, and He can even speak to you in the inner recesses of your mind and heart through the indwelling Holy Spirit. That's why I love Isaiah 30, 21, which says, whether you turn to the right or to the left. That means when you're at a decision point, whether you turn to the right or to the left, you will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way walk in it. Whose voice is that? God's. Can you, do you see the advantage we have as believers? God knows what's around the corner. He can see the future. And so often, here's what we do, guys. We go make a decision, a business decision. Hey, God, will you bless this decision I just made? God didn't want you to make that decision in the first place. So we get ourselves in this mess. And so God, when you're born again, you're indwelt by His Spirit. And then you begin to read God's Word. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. So that as you study God's Word... You begin to take on the mind of Christ. You actually begin to think like God. And you can discern between what's right and wrong, what's between good and evil. And then prayer is the way you talk back to God. And so it's a two-way conversation. That's why I, I try to always begin my quiet time before I pick up the Bible and read it. By the way, I'm working my way through the Gospels. Um, I'm taking my time with it, but I'm working my way through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I, you know, I got back from Israel in October, and, and it's like coming alive. It's in color now when I read about the Sea of Galilee or Capernaum or, or some of these places. I, I've been there. I've seen them. But before I read the Bible, I say, Lord, will you please speak to me from your word? And he always does. He will lift a verse off the page, and it's like he's talking to me. So if God prays to communicate with him, why is prayer so difficult? You see, for the Christian, praying should be like breathing. Just as breathing is the response of physical life to the presence of air, so prayer should be the response of the spiritual life to the presence of God. In other words, if the Spirit of God indwells you, then you should be praying because it's just a natural thing to do. We seem to be good at breathing. How come we have so much trouble praying? Nancy Spiegelberg said, Lord, I crawled across the barrenness to you with my empty cup, uncertain in asking any small drop of refreshment. If only I had known you better, I'd have come running with a bucket. You want to hear that again? Lord, I crawled across the barrenness to you with my empty cup, 
uncertain in asking any small drop of refreshment. If I had known you better, Lord, I'd have come running with a bucket. We talk about going to the creator of the universe who owns everything. And sometimes our prayers limit God because we don't think He can do what He says He can. You see, the more time we spend with God, the more time, the more we get to know Him. The, the more He becomes your friend and your father and your comforter. It's like your best friend. You love being with your best friend. You love going out and playing golf with them or whatever you do. You, you're willing to open up to this friend of yours and share things that are deep and intimate, things that, that you're happy about, things that you're sad about. That's the way it should be with God. But I believe there are several hur hurdles to prayer. First, it's difficult to talk to someone that you don't know. It's difficult to spend time with someone that you really don't love. It's difficult to expend your inner energy on something you really don't believe will work. It's difficult to, to do anything without exercising discipline. And it's difficult to do anything when someone stands in your way. We have an enemy man who does not want us to pray. And he will do everything within his power to keep you from getting on your knees. And when you get on your knees and pray, if you notice how quickly your mind wanders to something else that has nothing to do with prayer, we need to be men who pray. Daniel was a man of prayer. And because men, he was a, a man of prayer, he was highly esteemed in God's sight. Did you know that Joseph and Daniel are the only two men in the Bible, and really, I would really say, this is outside of Jesus, that Daniel is the only man in the Bible where there's nothing negative or critical said about him. And that doesn't mean he was perfect. But he was highly esteemed in God's eyes. And do you know why I believe he was? Because he believed in God with all of his heart and mind and soul. Do you want to be highly esteemed in God's sight? I do. Be a man of prayer. Samuel Chadwick said, the one concern of the devil is to keep Christians from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil, mocks at our wisdom, but he trembles when we pray. Thomas Watson said, prayer delights God's ear. It melts his heart. It opens his hand. God cannot deny a praying soul. And I believe that's true. Daniel proved that he would rather spend a night with the lions than miss a day in prayer. James 5, 16 says, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. We have no clue how powerful and effective our prayers are. This doesn't say the prayer of a hundred men. This is the prayer of a righteous man. That means a man who is in right standing with God, which simply means that he has repented, come to the cross, placed his trust in Jesus. Then God says, you're in right standing with me, and I declare you righteous. That man, when he gets on his knees, is, is crying out to the God of the universe for help. And do you think the God of the universe is not going to respond he is. Now let's take a look at Daniel chapter 9. And I want us to examine in detail Daniel's prayer. So look, I'm going to go back to verse 1. In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler of the Babylonian kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from what? The scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last how many years? Seventy. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with Him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps His covenant of love with all who love Him and obey His commands, we have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from Your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are righteous. But this day, we are covered with shame. The men of Judah and people of Jerusalem and all of Israel, both near and far, in all the countries where you have scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you. O oh Lord, we and our kings, our princes, and our fathers are covered with shame because we have sinned against you. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving even though we have rebelled against Him. 
We have not obeyed the Lord our God or kept the laws he gave us through his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. You have fulfilled the words spoken against us and against our rulers by bringing upon us great disaster. Who brought this to great disaster? Who? God. I thought he was this grandfather figure that just loves everybody. Under the whole heaven, nothing has been done like what has been done to, to Jerusalem. At this time, Daniel is, is an old man, probably in his 80s. And Jerusalem lies in ruins. Ruins. In fact, when Nehemiah and Ezra lead a group back to Jerusalem, they say it's so ruined it can't be rebuilt. And so this is the desolation of Jerusalem. The Lord do not hesitate to bring this, the disaster upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in everything he does, yet we have not obeyed him. Now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand, and you made for yourself a name that endures to this day, we have sinned, we have done wrong. O Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. Our sins and the iniquities of our fathers have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all those around us. Do you think we need to have the same prayer prayed over our country? And so from this model of a prayer, I want to show you how we should pray. And here's the first thing. Daniel began his day in the Scriptures, in the Word of God, and that's how our day should begin. In verse 2, Daniel says, I understood from the Scriptures, according to the Word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So let me ask you something, man. Would you like to know what God's will is for your life? <laughs> Listen, you cannot know how to pray until you know God's will. And the way to know God's will is to read His Word. And when you study God's Word, you begin to understand God's will, and then you know how to pray. Daniel learned, and I want to show you how this happens with Daniel. Daniel learned from reading Jeremiah. So while he's in Babylon, he obviously has a scroll. It's, it's the, it's the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, and he is reading it morning, noon, and night. And when he gets to, you know, when he gets to Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 8, he learns that they're, they're, they're going to be in Babylon in captivity for 70 years. Here's what Jeremiah writes in chapter 25, verse 8. He says, Therefore, the Lord Almighty says this, because you have not listened to my words. And again, Jeremiah now is looking into the future. This is before the Babylonians have come and taken Daniel and his friends to Babylon. So I'm going back in time to when Jeremiah was alive, and he's looking into the future. And he says, Therefore, the Lord Almighty says this, because you have not listened to my words. He's talking to the people of Judah. I will summon all the peoples of the north, this is God speaking. And my servant Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, declares the Lord. And I will bring them against this land. This whole country will become a desolate wasteland. And these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. But here's the promise. But when the 70 years are fulfilled, I will punish the king of Babylon and his nation, the land of the Babylonians, for their guilt, declares the Lord. And will make it desolate forever. And so Daniel finds himself, he's counting down the years. He's been in Babylon now for 68 years. He knows that the time is almost up. And he knows that God is going to be faithful to his word and he's promised to restore Jerusalem. How did he know this? Jeremiah 29 says, this is what the Lord says, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in the future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. So Jeremiah was saying that when the 70 years are up, that God has great plans that he was going to prosper them. And he knew ahead of time that Daniel would read this and that Daniel would pray. Because Jeremiah prophesied that you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I'll listen to you. And so Daniel came before God with great boldness because he knew God's will. 
and he prayed according to God's will. And God listened, and God responded. So, men, I'm showing you how we should come before the throne of God. I'm not talking about in a church, at an altar, although that's a good place to do it. I'm talking about at your home, in your prayer closet, or in your office, when you go shut the door and get on your knees. That's what I do. I go lock the door, and I don't want anybody coming into my office. And I get down on my carpet, sometimes so I can smell the dust in it. <laughs> and I come before my Heavenly Father with boldness and humility. Hebrews 4, verses 14 and 16 says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest, who's our high priest? Jesus, who has gone through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are. Did y'all hear that, man? You, some of you men who are struggling with great temptation and you've committed egregious sins and you think Jesus hates you. What does it say there? He said he's been tempted in every way that you've been tempted. I find that hard to believe, really, because I know how I've been tempted. But that's what the book says. And the book don't what? Don't lie. And, and not only has he been tempted, and because he's been tempted, he sympathizes with our weaknesses. You know, because he, guys, he knows that we're made of dust. He remembers that. He, he's a sympathetic father. It doesn't matter what you've done. He just wants you to run to him and ask for forgiveness and be willing to turn away from it, and he'll help you. Yeah, it says he was without sin. He says, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence. Why? So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Who, who needs mercy and grace? Okay, so let me ask you something, guys. Tomorrow morning, before you, wherever you have your quiet time, if you don't have a quiet time, you need to have one. I want you to read this verse and fall on your knees and ask God for His grace and mercy. That's the way you should start your day. Dio Moody said, we are to ask with a beggar's humility, to seek with a servant's carefulness, and to knock with the confidence of a friend. During the summer of 1999, my wife, Creasy, was reading her Bible with, with both of our boys on her heart. I have two sons, Rushman and Smith. And at the time, Creasy had a very heavy heart. And his wife, as young, as young parents, we made a very tough decision to send both of our boys away to school. And I have to be honest. <laughs> I don't know if I'd do it again. It's one of the most difficult decisions I've ever made in my life. They both went to the Macaulay School, which is in Chattanooga, Tennessee, which is a prep school. It's eight hours from our house. And I can remember many a Sunday night driving my two sons to the airport and watching them board that jet and disappear into the clouds. And my wife and I would get back in our car, drive back to my, our house, not saying a word, with tears in our eyes. On June 1st, 1999, while Chrissy was reading of all books, Jeremiah, this is what she read in Jeremiah chapter 24, verses 6 and 7. My eyes will watch over them for their good, and I will bring them back to this land. I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant them and not uproot them. I will give them a heart to know me, that I'm the Lord. They will be my people. My two sons will be God's people. I will be their God, for they will return to me with all their heart. My wife began to pray that, those verses back to God. She's still praying it. And these two verses seem to leap off the page. She, he, God was telling my wife that he was going to watch over our boys. Christy began to claim these promises, and we still claim the promises in these two verses, and God has been faithful. He did bring them back. He did watch over them for their good. And He gave them, both of my sons, a heart to know them. And both of my boys today are, are walking with the Lord. Not perfectly, but they're walking with Him. They both, they both have three children. They're, they're training up their children to, to, in, in the, to walk in the way of the Lord that are led by godly men who preach the truth of God's words boldly. When I told my son Rushman, he's, Rushman's my fighter. I told him, I said, Rushman, I got a lot of, um, 
I was kind of kidding, exaggerating. I said, I've got a lot of people down here who are kind of attacking me because of my stance against liberal theology. He said, Dad, tell me who they are and where they are. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to know how to pray, then spend time in God's Word to understand God's will. Daniel gives us a model for prayer, and it begins by listening to God. Once Daniel knew God's will, then Daniel began to pray, and here's how he prayed. Daniel praised God for who he is. In other words, Daniel acknowledged the attributes of God and praised Him for those attributes. In praising God for who He is, Daniel was also reminding God of what He can and will do. In other words, Daniel was taking the Bible like this and holding up to God and saying, God, this is what it says about you. Just reminding you. You think God has a problem with that? I don't. God, he's, he was saying, God, here's what you promised, and I not only believe that you can do what you promised, but I believe you will. Do you know why it's okay to do this? To God, to remind Him of His Word. Because when you have spent time in God's Word, and then you remind Him of what He said, God sees that you what? God sees that you what? Trust. What else? What's another word? Believe. That's what he's looking for. He's looking for men who believe, who trust him. That's why he loved David, even though David was a great sinner. David believed God. In verse 4, Daniel praised God for his greatness, his faithfulness, and his love. Daniel reminded God that because of his greatness, he had the power to deliver on his promises. And because of his faithfulness, he would. And all this was based on God's love for Israel. Daniel knew that God could and would bring the Israelites back to their land to restore Jerusalem. Why? Because Daniel understood the great love that God has for us. Ben, do you understand how much God loves you? Um, there's a great German theologian, Karl Barth, Barth. and he, when he was uh, in his like 80s, one of his students said, uh, Dr. Barth, after all these years of studying all these great theology, reading all these theological books. What's the greatest theological truth that you've ever learned? And he responded, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Amen. Paul writes in Ephesians 3, 17 and 18, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love may, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. When Jesus stretched out his arms like this, he was showing us how wide his love is. Everyone is invited. Don't let anybody ever tell you that Christianity is exclusive. It's open to everyone. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be what? Saved. It's, there's just only one way to come. That's the problem that modern theologians have. <laughs> how long is God's love? It doesn't matter how long you've been sinning. His patience and mercy is longer than you got life. How high is His love? When He died on the cross, He showed you how high His love is, how great it is. You can't... He paid it. He bought us with the precious blood of His Son. And my favorite one is how deep is His love. It doesn't matter how deep you've sunk down into sin. He will reach down into the pit of hell and bring you up. There was a certain medieval monk who announced that he would be preaching the following Sunday evening on the love of God. And so the following Sunday, as the shadows fell and the light ceased to come in through the cathedral windows, the, the congregation began to come in and quietly sit. In the darkness of the altar, the monk lit a candle and carried it to the crucifix where he first illuminated the crown of thorns. Then he illuminated the two wounded hands, then the marks of the spear wound. A hush fell over the crowd. Then the monk blew out the candle and left. There was nothing else to say. John 15, 13 says, Jesus said, Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. Men, Jesus loves you to the point where that if you were the only man 
Kip, if you were the only man, even though you're wearing that Tar Heel shirt tonight. Have y'all noticed this? You've got a UNC shirt on tonight. Hell has frozen over. He's been listening to my preaching so long, he's now a Tar Heel. <laughs> Kip. If Kip was the only man, even being from Nightdale, that would have ever believed Jesus would have died for Kip. That's just put your name there. He would have died for one believer. In verse 9, Daniel praised God for his mercy and forgiveness. See, here's the bottom line. We do not deserve God's mercy and forgiveness. We deserve his justice, which would lead to his judgment. Jeremiah, when he finished writing the book of Jeremiah, he lamented over the condition of his people. And that's where you get the book of Lamentations. In chapter 3, it says, it is because of the Lord's great mercies that we're not consumed. Did y'all hear that? It's because of the Lord's great mercies that he doesn't destroy the world right now. Because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. That's why we sang that hymn. Because of his great mercy, not only we're not consumed, but he is willing to forgive us no matter what we've done. And listen to all that we've done. Daniel's prayer began with praise, but then he moved to confession. In verses 5 through 14, Daniel confessed the following. We have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets. We are covered with shame. We have not obeyed the Lord. We have sinned against you. On and on he goes. And here's what, the God, here's what God says about us. If you pass your heart through the Bible, it's like an x-ray machine. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. The King James Verse says, Desperately wicked. You know, a lot of people, we talked about this tonight, who are religious, they don't see themselves as really wicked and sinful and evil. Do you know why? Well, there are a couple of reasons. One is they don't understand the holiness of God. And second, they're comparing themselves to the people who have been in central prison. Do you know the difference between us and the men in central prison? There are bars between us. That's the only difference. In God's eyes, we're just as guilty as they are. Just a matter of, deg just a matter of degree. I may hate someone. He murdered someone. Jesus says it's the same. In Romans 3, Paul writes, there's no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands. No one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There's no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Just look at our country. Ruin and misery mark their ways. In the way of peace, they do not know. And the reason for all this happens is because there's no fear of God before their eyes. We deserve God's judgment. In verse 14, Daniel says, The Lord did not hesitate to bring the disaster upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in everything He does, yet we have not obeyed Him. I believe that our nation, then, is in the same boat as Israel. Not only have we not listened to God, but we as a nation have turned away from Him and have committed great wickedness. And there's only one hope for our country. And His name is what? Jesus. Jesus. I was watching them last night on Fox News talking about racial reconciliation. They said, we've never had anything in this country about racial reconciliation. I, I want to shout, have you ever heard of promise keepers? <laughs> that was one of the main, main um, purposes of promise keepers was to bring racial reconciliation. I wish we had more African American men in here. I'm thankful for the ones that come. Jesus is the only one who can bring down the dividing wall between the races. He's the only hope we have. It's Jesus. Daniel began, Daniel's prayer began with praise, and it moved to confession, and then it ended with petition. I'm almost done. Look at verses 17 through 19. Now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant, O Lord. Look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, O God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make request of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. O Lord, hear and act. For whose sake? 
for your sake, O oh my God. Do not delay because your city and your people bear your name. No, I want you to notice that in Daniel's request, he asked for God to be glorified, not himself and not Israel. And Daniel appealed to two qualities of God, his mercy and his honor. You see, so many oftentimes we go into prayer, it's all about us. Lord, help me with this, help me with that, do this, do that. See, Daniel has shown us a different way to pray. Pray in such a way, man, this will change the way you pray, that, that your prayer request leads to God being glorified. And pray according to His mercy. One of the mightiest men of prayer was George Mueller, who lived in Bristol, England, who in the last 60 years of his life cared for more than 10,000 orphans. He obtained the English equivalent, and this is the 19th century, back in the 1800s, of $7,200,000, and he did it all by prayer. He, he never asked for any money. He would just go and pray. When it was laid upon his heart to pray for anything, he would search the scriptures to find some promise that covered the situation. And sometimes he would search the Bible for days just looking for a promise that related to his need. And when he found that promise, he would take his Bible and show it to God. And he always prayed with his Bible open. Nancy Spielberg said, If only I had known you better, out of come running with a bucket. We get to know God in His will by spending time in His Word, and then we can come running to Him with a bucket. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You for Your Word. And Lord, I thank You that You are a good, good Father who loves to give good, good gifts to Your children. And I thank You, Lord, that Your love is so deep and high and long and wide, immeasurable, and that You love us so much and that you sympathize with us. Lord, I pray for every man in here that he will experience, that they will experience your grace and mercy. As we go to sleep tonight, Lord, get, bless us all with the most gentle, peaceful sleep as we close our eyes and lift our hearts up to you. And thank you for the day. And look forward to the day that's coming because your mercies are new every morning. Thank you for the strength to live for today in the great hope that we have for tomorrow. It's in your name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, guys, see you next week.